Good afternoon and welcome to City Club of Portland Friday Forum. I am John Horvick, President of City Club, and I'd like to welcome members and guests alike. Those of you who join us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB Radio or watching on Portland Community Media. Today, Sarah Merck will interview Commissioner Steve Novick, but first, some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum corporate sponsors are Geffen Mesher, Iberdrola Renewables, Perkins Cooey, Portland General Electric, and Providence Health and Services. We are grateful for your support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of them. New hope is on the horizon for HIV vaccines that work, and that work is being done right here at our own Oregon Health and Sciences University. Next week, Dr. Lewis Picker, Associate Director of OHSU's Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute, will discuss his research and the broader topic of AIDS vaccine research. The following week, we will broadcast live on Oregon Public Radio's Think Out Loud from here at the Governor Hotel to discuss the results of the Oregon Values and Beliefs Survey. Oregon's most recent effort to speak with all Oregonians about what they really think, really value, and really believe. Doors for the Think Out Loud event will open at 11.15, and the program will begin at 11.50. You can learn more about these and other club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, we'll be live tweeting at today's event. You can follow or mention us at PDX City Club. Be sure to use the hashtag City Club in your own tweets. We'll be having a Q&A session with Commissioner Novick at the, end, at the end of today's program. Members, please come to the microphone to ask your questions. For all our audience participants, please locate the index cards in the center of your tables and write your questions on them during the forum. We'll collect them prior to the start of the Q&A. And now to our program. Since starting his first term earlier this year, Commissioner Novick has said that his focus will be on looking for opportunities to, quote, Take action now to avoid problems later. On health care and economic equity, Commissioner Novick has said, we can strengthen our economy by making Portland a model for reducing health care costs. And he has questioned the use of urban renewal as a primary economic development strategy, saying that it has too often exacerbated rather than alleviated racial and geographic disparities in Portlanders' standard of living. Commissioner Novick is the commissioner in charge of the Bureau of Transportation, the Bureau of Emergency Communications, and the Bureau of Emergency Management. His early actions as commissioner include hiring a new director of transportation, investigating the possible misuse of handicap parking permits, and leading the effort to put up a temporary barrier on the Vista Bridge in an effort to prevent suicides. Commissioner Novick, a longtime Selwood Moreland resident and City Club member, now lives with his fiance, Rachel Fileski, and their Welsh Corgi pumpkin in the Multnomah Village neighborhood. Commissioner Novick will be interviewed by Sarah Merck. Sarah is a Portland-based journalist who often writes about politics, gender, and pop culture. She worked for four years as a reporter at the Portland Mercury and is now the online editor for the national feminist magazine, Bitch. Please help me welcome Commissioner Steve Novick and Sarah Merck to the stage. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us here. And hi, Steve. How are hi, you? Hi, Sarah. Good. <laughs> it's great to see you again. It's very good to see you. Um, I guess we should just launch in because we don't have that much time. Um, but we all know you as a politician and can read your resume, but I wanted to start off by having you tell us about who you are as a, as a human. Uh, you, I know you grew up in New Jersey and in Cottage Grove. Can you tell us about that and your background? Well, to be honest, I lived in New Jersey for six weeks. And, but in my campaign biography, when I ran for Senate, I said that I was born in New Jersey, which is true. I didn't want to highlight the fact that my family moved from California, um, because we know that Oregonians hate Californians. Uh, but, but I grew up in, in Northern California and around Cottage Grove um, with a good, solid, progressive family. My mother was one of the first Head Start teachers. Uh, my dad ran an underground newspaper in San Francisco um, in the 60s and then became a union organizer. Uh, and I feel 
Uh, one of the reasons I like Stephen Colbert is that I think I share um, certain cultural reference points with him. I mean, I too know way too much about The Lord of the Rings. Uh, I too have a bit of a playful obsession with Richard Nixon. Um, but mostly, I mean, it's sort of a regulation, all-American guy. I mean, I, I believe in the America of the 1950s, when Eisenhower was president, when we had 30% union density, when there was no designated hitter, and Mays and Mantle and Aaron were in the outfield, and rich people paid really high taxes. <laughs> and uh, I wish we could have that America again, except with civil rights for women and gay people and people of color. <laughs> I, I had never heard of your dad's underground newspaper before. What was, what was that called? It was called the Express Times, and it was, uh, I think it's probably its most famous headline was on election day in 68 when the headline was, you may have to take bleep, but you don't have to vote for it. Stay home. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so you were, you were just elected to Portland City Council this past year, and I'm interested in what's been surprising to you so far. What sort of issues have cropped up that you weren't expecting? Well, what's been most surprising is how much attention we get. I mean, I, every time I turn around, one of us is on TV, and I'm not used to that. Um, and the legislature doesn't get that kind of attention. They really should. The county doesn't that kind of attention. They should. But I guess we're just right downtown, so we're easy to find. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of issues that have come up that I wasn't familiar with um, that have been exciting to deal with. Um, one, it has, one has been the issue of disabled parking downtown, which is a really naughty issue and it's hard to resolve it without um, you know, bruising some, some, some feelings and taking on some tough choices. But I just had no idea that you know, 30, 40 percent of the spaces in the core of downtown are taken by people with placards. And it wasn't until I took a walk along with a parking enforcement person that I just saw that with my own eyes. Um, another issue that um, I wasn't familiar with that I'm excited that we might be able to figure out some way to deal with it, it's a long-term issue, is um, although we love buses, buses are great things. I mean, if more people were able to take buses, then we'd save, more, save money on gas, we'd have less congestion, um, and actually when people take buses, they walk more because you're walking to the bus, and the bus station and away from the bus stations, so that makes people healthier, that saves money on health insurance but buses impose a bunch of wear and tear on the roads. Um, in fact, one of our pavement management guys at the Bureau of Transportation gave a presentation on pavement in various states of repair and disrepair, and he came to one slide and he said, this slide isn't illustrating anything particularly interesting about the pavement. I just wanted the commissioner to know that that's the enemy, and it was a picture of a bus. <laughs> uh, but then afterwards, um, the chief of engineering at Peabody came up and said, you know, if somebody could figure out a way to build a double axle bus for urban transport, then the buses, the weight would be better distributed, the buses wouldn't impair, Im impose the kind of wear and tear on the roads that they do. So somehow we need to have a partnership between the cities of America and maybe the federal government to get somebody to build a double axle bus and then we could subsidize the transit agencies of America to buy them. Um, so that's an example of something, I mean, an issue that I wasn't aware of with a solution that I wouldn't have thought of. So I got on the phone with the Undersecretary of Transportation for Policy and said, hey, can we get working on this? And she said, that sounds interesting. Let's look at it. So you didn't campaign on a double axle bus platform, mm. and yet... Mm. Exactly. I did not campaign. The, I, and frankly, to be honest, I wouldn't know an axle if somebody hit me with one. <laughs> <laughs> So do you, do you take the bus much yourself? How is it you get around town, since you're the Commissioner of Transportation? I do take the bus a fair amount. I mean, usually I do a very lazy thing. My fiance, Rachel, um, works, across, we live on the west side. She works in Multnomah County, which is the east side, so she just drops me off on her way to work often. When our schedules don't mesh, like this morning, I do take the bus, which is absurdly easy, uh, because it's a block away. Um, and coming home, if I'm there late, I mean, quite often I'll take the bus. I mean, I am a classic example of somebody who my mode of transportation depends on convenience. When I lived in Washington, D.C., where we had a great subway system, I didn't own a car. Um, when I commuted to Salem, I drove too much and wasn't always as good as I should have been about carpooling. Now I'm a block away from a bus stop, so I take the bus a fair amount. Mm -hmm. And it's a nice ride? It's a very, it's, it's a very nice ride. I know that the public transit gets some, some heat in Portland. Everybody seems to love it or hate it. Everybody's got an opinion on TriMet. What's, what's been your experience in office working on uh, issues of public transportation? 
Um, you know, we have a strong partnership with TriMet. We work closely together in figuring out when we're divvying up pots of federal money, who's going to apply for what and who's going to support whose proposals. Um, a, a lot of what we need to do in Portland is improve access to transit. Mm -hmm. So when citizens and the government get together, like in uh, developing the East Portland in Motion Plan um, over the past couple of years, people in East Portland and people of the city and people at TriMet look at where do people need better access to transit? Where do you need more sidewalks and better crossings, you know, safer crossings in order for people to get to the bus station? So um, we work very closely together and we're committed to working to make transit more accessible and, um, and more frequent and more expansive. Has anything about public transit policy surprised you since you've been in office? Is it different working on the side of the issue now that you're an elected official than just being a person out in town who cares about taking the bus? Um, it's, well, it's been reinforced for me how much transportation matters to people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, I think, like late winter, like in February, I went to visit a fifth grade class at Harrison Park Elementary, which is at 87th just off division. Um, I know a teacher there. And I was asking the kids what their priorities were in terms of various public services. And one of the questions I ask is, if you had to choose between having a new park in your neighborhood and having a better sidewalk network, what would you pick? And the kids by about 19 to 1 said sidewalks. Now, parks are important. They'd love to have parks, but not having sidewalks was a real burden to them. Mm -hmm. And it's been, actually, I want to give a shout out to Sam Adams for his investing in sidewalks for the Outer East Side and for the West Side. Um, during his term in office and just um, actually brought some quotes from people on the Outer East Side about the impact that those sidewalk projects has made in their lives. Um, one woman said that since the sidewalk went in in the stretch of 162nd that she and her mother take to get to the bus, um, the walk has been reduced from 40 minutes to 25 minutes. Um, and she doesn't have to bring an extra pair of sh shoes to wear at work because the first pair was so muddy. Um, Linda Robertson, Robinson, a um, major East Portland activist, says that she used to see people in wheelchairs in the bike lanes between Northeast 102nd and 112th and Northeast Widler, but now people with mobility devices are using the new sidewalks with ramps. Uh, Arlene Kimura with the Hazelwood Neighborhood Association said that she's been heartened to see students using the sidewalk in safer crossings in Southeast Stark between 126th and 160th. Mike Vanderveen, an East Portland parent, said he used to watch students navigating mud puddles on their way to Glenfair Elementary School and now sees they're safely walking on Gleason at the 148th and New Sidewalk. So those, I mean, uh, thank you, Mayor Adams, for making those investments, and we're going to need to raise the money to make a lot more of those investments over the next couple of years. Yes, yeah, sidewalks are one of those issues that no one is against, but no one really wants to make funding a priority for. You know, there's nobody who's anti-sidewalk. But I know you've worked in just your time in office on coming up with ideas for how to pay for sidewalks. What, what's the status of that now? What are you working I on? I mean, I don't have any brilliant new ways of raising money. I mean, we're going to look at an assortment of possibilities, and I wouldn't be surprised if we come up with a package with various different kinds of revenue sources. Uh, but I'm looking forward to, over the next number of months, um, refining the needs. I mean, the East Portland in Motion Plan, which I happen to have, have right here, um, has a, a long list of projects that should be done. We just approved a grant um, to create a Southwest in Motion, a swim plan to help people in Southwest identify their priorities. But then we need to, I mean, whatever the funding mechanism is, we're going to need to make the political case for it. And I think that one thing we need to do in transportation is explain that although we might be asking you now for more money for public services, it's going to mean you're going to save money on what you spend privately. Because um, or Portlanders spend $240 million a year on repair and maintenance of their cars. They spend over $600 million a year on gas. If we make it easier for people to bike and walk and take transit, a lot of people are going to be able to cut down on their car expenses. And even if you continue to drive, the fact that other people are biking and walking more is going to reduce your health care premiums because most of us are we have health insurance we're part of a big pool and whenever anybody in that pool gets healthier then our health care costs go down so the more people are biking and walking and getting healthier the more we save in health care costs 
You mentioned the Southwest in Motion plan and also that's where you live. One of the big topics in uh, Southwest right now is what to do about Southwest Barber, which is a really busy road that's it's rather unsafe. It's hard to walk on, it's hard to bike on. Do you think the city should push the Oregon Department of Transportation to do a road diet on Barber or change Barber in some way to make it a lot safer? We definitely will push them to study it because uh, I think it's something that deserves serious consideration. Um, one thing we need to remember when we're dealing with ODOT is that it's their job to think about the roads as state roads on which people go from community to community. And um, where they have to listen to people in Tigard who say, if you give, have a road diet on Barber, that's going to increase the length of my commute. Um, now, I'm not saying that that should be the decisive factor, but it's something that we have to look at. It's something we have to look at even in town. Um, right now, we're talking about doing a road, potentially a road diet on Foster, and there's people in Lentz who say, well, what are we going to get out of that? Because that, will in that might increase the length of time it takes us to go downtown. Um, so in terms of safety, um, and livability in the immediate neighborhood, things like road diets generally are a no-brainer, but you have to think about the downstream impact and try to come up with a way to, you know, to take everybody's interest into account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting balance where the Oregon Department of Transportation's job is to listen to people on Tigard, but it's also to listen to people in Portland. So, like, what's your role as a politician there who's representing Portland and you're also in the neighborhood. How, how, how do you balance that role I think, between I think governments? What you, I think what you do is you advocate strongly for the interests of people in Portland, but you recognize that ODOT has to worry about people in Tigard. We also have to recognize that uh, people from Tigard sit on the regional fund allocation um, boards with the people from Portland, and we all need to work together to figure out how best to divide mm -hmm. the money. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a balancing act. Mm -hmm. A similar issue is uh, that City Club recently adopted a really big report that's encouraging the city to boost investments in safer, more integrated bike infrastructure. And uh, this could involve some projects that will provoke opposition, like removing car lanes or removing some, arterial or some arterials um, or redirecting funding from other transportation projects. And you've talked in public about building an economic case to build broader support for bicycling, including from the business community building that support. Can you tell us about what that looks like and how it changes this conversation around transportation funding to look to the business community for support? Well, I mean, it's partly a continuation of what I was saying before. The, the, I mean, the business community actually, since we have a system in this country where employers pay for health insurance, we can go to the business community, those that do provide health insurance, and say, um, even if it had no obvious impact on people coming to your door, the fact that people biking more means reduced health care costs help you since you're paying for health insurance. Mm -hmm. We can also make the case, at least for retail businesses, that bicyclists um, actually shop more. You know, a bicycle visitor to a neighborhood um, will buy more over time than somebody who's driving a car. Um, partly, frankly, that's because bicyclists tend to be higher income, but also they have more disposable income because they're not spending as much of it on gas and on car repairs. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, so I think that if you, make, you make the case that you save in health care costs, you make the case to retailers that bicyclists are good for them, um, and you make the case that everybody has, I mean, Oregon doesn't, doesn't produce much oil. Oregon, at this point, isn't a car manufacturing center. Mm -hmm. If people aren't spending money on cars and on gas, then they'll have more to spend locally. But we also need to tell business people and other people in the city that um, we have a huge deficit in terms of basic street maintenance. I mean, the auditor's report last year said that we're spending $75 million a year less than we would need simply to maintain the streets we already have. So to spend more money on sidewalks and safety and even uh, bicycle infrastructure, although frankly, you know, putting a white stripe down doesn't cost very much money, um, we need to say not only do we need to ask for enough money to keep up with our maintenance needs, we're going to ask for a bit more to have a stronger transportation network. Mm -hmm. You spoke to a big cultural shift in that people nationwide and in Portland are using less gas these days. I'm interested in how should the city respond to that, to that shift in people using less and less gas? I think that, I mean, it's good that we're running with the wind. Um, I think you respond by saying, okay, if people want to walk more and bike more and use transit more, then let's give them the opportunity to do that. Um, and it does help to be able to tell people who are skeptical that um, actually it's already happening. 
um, that it's not true that you'll build these bike lanes and nobody will occupy them. Um, I had an opportunity last year to go to, to Denmark, to Copenhagen, where 40% of the trips are taken by bike. And Copenhagen does not look like a little toy city that you can't imagine being taken to scale. I mean, it's a real city with real grit and real business, and people are riding bikes all over the place. And it's interesting, the Danish government justifies their ex expenditure on bike infrastructure by looking at the health care implications. Um, and it, of course, it helps when the government's paying for health care. I mean, you see an immediate return. Uh, but they do the analysis. And actually, they're, pretty, they're clearly quite serious about it, because I saw one analysis they did of, should we put in a new bike ped bridge? And uh, they concluded, well, there would be a bit of a health loss, because there are some people who currently bike who will have their commute reduced, so they'll bike a bit less. But enough, <laughs> new, pe but enough new people will start biking and walking that it's, that it's worth it. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was quite clear that this was serious economic analysis. Was, this wasn't the Danish government trying to, you know, uh, make things look good that they wanted to do anyway. They said, okay, how many people are going to bike and, bike and walk? How many more miles have we put this in? And what are the savings in healthcare costs? Mm -hmm. One big bike program that Portland's been pushing for and working on is bike share, having a fleet of shareable bikes throughout the central city. Do you know what's going on with that program right now? What's the timeline for implementation and where are we at? What's going on is we are looking for private funders. We're having um, serious conversations in smoke-filled rooms with people with money, um, <laughs> trying to convince them that this will buy them really good advertising. Uh, so that's what's going on. <laughs> um, that's great. Um, do we have a, is there a timeline yet for when that's going to be implemented or when we can actually see bike share on the ground? As soon as we can convince all of these donors that it's worth their while to step up and hand over a bunch of money really quickly. <laughs> Sounds like you'll need to find some more smoky rooms. Um, I kind of hate talking about parking because it seems like parking only inspires anger, but what's your big picture philosophy on parking? What should be the big ideas and goals behind the city's policies on parking requirements and cost? Well, um, there's a guy named Donald Shoup who wrote this 700-page tome a few years ago called The High Cost of Free Parking. Now, I confess I have not read the 700 pages, but I have read the three-page synopsis of it in a really cool <laughs> book called Traffic by a guy named Tom Vanderbilt that I highly recommend. And what Shoup points out, basically, is that when you don't charge for parking in a busy area where people would pay for parking, then basically what you're doing is saying to people, we're encouraging you to drive around in circles endlessly looking for a perfect free parking space. And that increases congestion, and that increases pollution. I mean, there's places where a large portion of the traffic in a given area are people circling around looking for parking. Um, like, you know, any time I go to Northwest. I mean, to me, Northwest has become like a Yogi Berra kind of place where, you know, nobody goes there anywhere, it's too crowded. <laughs> um, so if you do charge for parking, then you're sending a signal that we want some of you to think about walking or biking or taking transit and therefore saving your money in your own pocketbook and also reducing health care costs. And you're also raising some money that you can spend on transportation, like building more sidewalks and uh, putting up more flashing beacons at dangerous intersections. So there's a strong case for charging for parking wherever you know people are going to pay for it. Now, the problem you have with charging for parking is that people who have to, I mean, the people who are going to Northwest to go to a fancy restaurant, they can pay to afford, to afford to pay the extra for parking. People who work at low paying jobs in those places where there isn't very good transit, um, then you could be putting a burden on them which is why I think it makes sense to see like the distinction between what we do with parking in downtown and what we're going to do with the Northwest Parking Plan. Downtown, where there's pretty darn good transit access, everybody pays for parking. Um, in Northwest, under the new parking plan, um, people who, are, who work in Northwest will be able to buy relatively low-cost parking permits. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to to some of the other issues that you work on at the city, um, you've had a couple of interesting ideas about health care and the city's role in health care. And as, uh, as Obama's Affordable Care Act starts enrollment this coming October, what do you think the city's role is in providing health care for its people or helping us get access? Well, in terms of the Obamacare rollout, um, what city employees can do when they encounter people who clearly have health needs is ask them, do you have health insurance? And if they don't, get them signed up. 
Um, and you know, the county can play an even much bigger role in that because they, they're involved in the healthcare business. Um, what we've been trying to do in terms of healthcare is partly just be a convener to share good ideas. I mean, the city has a fairly innovative program, although it's based on programs in other places, where we're doing fairly intensive outreach to people who have high health care costs who clearly are going to the hospital a lot, people, city employees and their families that are covered. And uh, Moda Health is, you know, has sort of health care coaches who are reaching out to folks and sort of asking, what's going on with you? Is there a way that you could, we can help you alter your lifestyle in a way that will result in you're not to going to the hospital as often, just to sort of be nudges. It's actually modeled on a program that the Casino Workers Union in Atlantic City developed a couple of years ago that Atul Gawande wrote about in The New Yorker. So one thing we've done is we've brought in uh, people from unions and other employers, including some big you know, HR people at good companies, just to listen to, to talk about what they're doing in terms of wellness and to listen to people talk about our program. And um, we're hoping to do more of that, just to you know, reach out to CEOs of companies and union leaders and pull them together and uh, bring them together with people like Joan Kapowicz, the head of the State Employee Benefits Board, to talk about the tremendous success that, sh that they've had in reducing health care costs just by doing aggressive wellness stuff, getting more people into smoking cessation programs, um, getting people to take action to reduce obesity. So that's one thing that, uh, particularly Katie Shriver in my office, I mean, she's, she's my liaison to the Bureau of Emergency Communications 911, but she spends a bunch of her time working on these broader healthcare issues. And also, in terms of city services, the Bureau of Emergency Communications 911 is, to some extent, a healthcare agency, because people make healthcare calls. And the Fire Bureau is a healthcare agency. They go out on healthcare calls. So one thing we've done is we've initiated conversations with the healthcare entities, the healthcare industry around the city, asking people, is there a way that we can more deliberately integrate 911 and fire into the healthcare system? For example, um, in some cases, when somebody has a healthcare call to 911, if we could maybe change our protocols a bit. So, I mean, right now the, the idea is get somebody on the road, get an ambulance, a fire engine as quickly as possible. Um, there might be some instances where you could ask a couple of questions and verify somebody isn't about, isn't in immediate danger, and then maybe say, let's link you up to your provider's telemedicine system if you didn't happen to have that phone number. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I mean, with the uh, one thing we've been talking about with Commissioner Saltzman is, is it possible to, uh, to some extent, turn some of the fire stations into doubling as urgent care clinics? And have them develop relationships with the, uh, the healthcare providers, where somebody, you know, if they've got a minor health issue, they go down to the firehouse, and the fire stations have a relationship with the healthcare provider. And sometimes the EMTs can just deal with their healthcare issues there. Sometimes they might Skype up a doctor. So that's we're, so we're trying to see what we can do to more deliberately integrate those parts of the city that are in healthcare into the wider healthcare picture. That does sound like some pretty interesting major and concrete changes with having our, our fire and ambulance system be more linked into the healthcare system. Is there a model for that that you've seen somewhere else that's been good, uh, or is this something you've developed? Actually, there are some cities that are ahead of us in terms of like feeding um, calls into nurse triage systems. There's also this guy named Art Kellerman with the RAND Corporation, who's sort of the Pied Piper of better integrating EMT services into the broader healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So we actually, he wrote a paper on this. He actually got in touch with um, my good friend, Kathy Kaufman from the Oregon Health Authority, who's right here. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> and uh, he was talking about this concept. So since I was with the, Kath with the city, Kathy got in touch with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that speaks to something that you've, that you've been sort of a big advocate of, which is improving interactions between systems of government, between the, the city government and the state government. You've worked in both. Um, can you speak to that about how how can our governments work better together, and are there any concrete issues on which you think our governments could do a lot better at, at integrating on? There's a whole host of them. I mean, um, one, I mean, one example I mentioned earlier, I mean, TriMet um, runs buses, and they don't, aren't responsible for pavement. So it's not in their immediate financial interest to worry about buying a double axle bus because it would probably cost more. But that's why the cities have, of America have to step up and say, um, we would subsidize you to buy such a thing if it penciled out because it would save us money. Mm -hmm. um, within city government, um, you know, the 911 works closely with both police and fire. And Saturday night, I spent from 8 p p.m. to 1 a.m. listening to a 911 dispatch 
and, uh, and call taking, and it was really fascinating. And one of the questions I asked was, do the police do this? As a matter of course, do all of the police do sit-alongs at BOAC and see what it's like for you guys? And they said, well, sometimes they do randomly, but it's not a something that's policy. So that's something that I've mentioned to the mayor and I want to take up with Chief Reese is I think that would be a good thing to do as part of their regular training or if they've already gone through training, something to start to do now, have the police sit with the call takers and see it from that side. One big issue that the legislature and the governor took some steps on this last session is having a more rational relationship between the local governments, particularly the counties, and the state government on public safety. We have this weird system where district attorneys impose costs on the state by getting people sentenced to prison. And it doesn't come out of their budget. I mean, it's free. A prison sentence to a DA is free. It comes out of the state budget. And there is no incentive at all for a DA to save money by maybe conserving a bit on prison resources. So the legislature took a bit of a step this year towards saying, if we can save money on prisons, we'll send local jurisdictions some of that money back to spend on more cost-effective methods of preventing crime. I mean, I'd like to see that be go be, beyond the step the legislature took and just say, look, um, if you beat the averages, if you as a county um, can reduce the number of people you're sending to our prisons um, compared to the state average, um, and but you come up with ways to reinvest the money in ways that we know work, then we will give you the money back. Um, I want to shout out that we've got about 10 more minutes left of this conversation, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, feel free to write it down on the index card that's in the center of your table and hold it up, and some city club staff will walk around and grab it. Great. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about sitting in on the 911 call center. What was that like? Was it terrifying? Was it surprising? Oh, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, and it was depressing at times, but it was also a lot of fun. And you realize they have these you know, really big, dis well, for one thing, I came out of thinking that we should outlaw fireworks, because you get these calls coming in saying, I heard something, might have been fireworks, might have been a shot. It's like, okay, well, probably it was fireworks. You don't know where it was, but you sort of have to send somebody out there in order to, I mean, what are they going to do, really? They don't know where the sound came from. Um, but, I mean, that's, uh, that's, so that's kind of annoying. Um, and also, there's, I mean, there was one call, an older woman called and said, I'm calling to report an incident of abuse. And then she hung up. And then the uh, call taker called, I was with, called back. And the woman answered, and the woman said, um, oh, don't worry, it's nothing. And then the call taker said, well, I need to talk, after a call like that, I need to talk to another adult in the house. Um, and so this guy came over and took the phone and said, yeah, don't worry, a chandelier fell, uh, people were upset, don't worry about it. And so she put down the phone and it's like, I'm not sure what to do, because I followed protocol, there was another adult in the house, I talked to him, but I still don't feel totally comfortable. And I don't know if she was thinking the same thing I was, which is, how often do chandeliers fall? I mean, it could be the woman called about a real incident and then she was intimidated. So she sent somebody out, which I thought was the right thing to do, but there was no like obvious answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, another thing that there's lots and lots of noise calls, people calling to complain about noisy neighbors. Uh, and that's something where um, we don't have, you know, our noise control unit itself outside the cops is like one guy, Paul Van Orden. I think actually we added one half of an FTE to that. And it seemed to me that that's something that we should have um, devote more resources to outside just having the police run out. I mean, um, maybe once we get a certain number of complaints, we start sending people tickets, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, I mean, it's a really tough job that they have. Um, and it's a really, really interesting job. I mean, I, I heard one story about the kind of conversation, they, they get a lot of um, accidental calls, or to put it, you know, butt dials, or people, you know, sitting on their phones and it makes an emergency call, and nobody's, and nobody's there to, to actually talk, and they said that sometimes they overhear some hilarious conversations for people who don't know they just called 911. <laughs> That's definitely a modern problem, is butt dialing 911, <laughs> and then <laughs> having a stranger listen to your conversation. Um, well, well, they, they hang up quickly, but oh, sometimes yeah. they just happen to overhear something funny. <laughs> That's interesting. I wonder how much it's cost. I wonder how much butt dialing is costing our city and resources. It's probably it's probably costing a significant amount. You should do a study on that, please. Um, <laughs> um, I was interested. Uh, one other issue you've been working on that's it's tangentially related to mental health is getting a barrier on the Vista Bridge in southwest Portland, um, a bridge where many people are, are likely to commit suicide. Can you talk about that effort? That's something, that's an issue that I, I mean, 
I tend to avoid stories about tragedies that make me too sad, so I wasn't aware of the reputation of Vista Bridge as Suicide Bridge until I read David Stabler's piece in The Oregonian in I think it was February. And what was interesting about his piece is that he went and talked to researchers who explained that uh, barriers actually do save lives because it's not true that somebody who jumped from one place was just going to kill themselves no matter what, they find another place to jump. I mean, in Washington, D.C., a bunch of people used to jump from the Duke Ellington Bridge, like four people a year. There's another bridge a few blocks away where two people a year would jump. They put up barriers in the Duke Ellington Bridge, and people said, well, they'll just jump from the other one. And actually, the number of jumps to the other one did not go up. I mean, people who are suicidal are irrational and sometimes they get fixated on a particular method of suicide, and if that's close to them, or if they haven't thought of what hasn't occurred to them to begin with, they won't do it. I mean, people in mental health say that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem, and if there's not a method that seems really av immediately available to them, the moment might pass. I mean, one dramatic uh, illustration of that is New York State has a really low rate of suicide. New York State also has the toughest gun laws in the country, and mental health experts think that is not a coincidence. So we made up, I made up my mind that we were going to put a barrier up on the Vista Bridge, which we did. I also told people in the neighborhood that we are going to look for the money to build uh, new permanent railings that will be more historically appropriate and be more aesthetically pleasing, but will also still prevent suicides. Mm -hmm. And actually, we're having a community conversation in the neighborhood to listen to people's suggestions about what a permanent solution might look like um, next week. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely an, an interesting issue because it's one small piece of such a big problem. I and mean, we've built a barrier on the Vista Bridge, but how does that address the root problem of mental health issues that are driving people to commit suicide? Did you? When you were working on this project, did you think of it as this is a drop in the bucket, or do you feel like it's actually a major step forward? Well, um, what I thought was 170 people have jumped from that bridge since 1926, and it's time for that to stop. And there were some people who said, well, that money should be going to mental health. And we spent $236,000 building that barrier, which I think might pay for one and a half psychiatrists for a year. And my reaction was, I don't think that hiring one and a half extra psychiatrists and throwing them randomly out into the community would save two lives a year necessarily, even though it would be a good thing. So although, I mean, I'm not a mental health expert, I mean, the city is not the mental health authority, I thought it was something that we could do that would make a difference. Um, one, one other big issue that you work on is uh, in the, the uh, Bureau of Emergency Communications, you have, it's your job to be prepared for the worst. Uh, right, sorry. the Bureau of Emergency, that's actually the Bureau of Emergency Management. Oh, sorry, yeah. uh, uh, Bureau of Emergency Services. Can you tell us about what uh, your Portland should do to prepare for a major earthquake and what your work is on that? We should do tons of stuff, both, you know, the, the, the city, the other governments, individual human beings. I mean, I was met yesterday with the Water Bureau and they're talking about um, the steps they're taking to identify the most vulnerable parts of their system. Um, and they've got, you know, miles and miles of really old cast iron pipe and they're replacing it gr gradually and one of the things they look at in determining what, what to replace when is how it affects how the overall system will operate in the event of an earthquake. Um, we, I mean, I've been doing my best to let people know in the community that one of the most important things people can do is to bolt their houses to their foundations. We've got um, up to 100,000 houses in town um, which were built before 1976 when the code required houses to be bolted down. Um, Rachel and I got our house bolted down a couple of weeks ago. It cost us about $4,000, um, which is fairly typical, although there are houses where it costs a lot more. It depends on the house. Um, and we think that that's a good investment in our future, but also in the future of the city, because that means that a house is likely to survive the earthquake, and the more houses survive the earthquake, the more people will stay in the city. Um, one thing that we're looking at is some California cities have required that when a house is sold, an automatic shutoff valve gets attached to your gas meter if you have natural gas. That costs a few hundred dollars. Um, and, I mean, people might remember from reading about the, the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, there's more destruction with the fires afterwards than for the earthquake itself. And putting in those gas shutoff valves uh, prevents fires. Uh, so we've talked to 
uh, other members of the council, particularly Amanda Fritz, and we've also talked to the state, which would have to approve that kind of code change about potentially doing that. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of things that we need to do um, as a city and as a community to get ready for the earthquake. A another an aspect of that I wasn't familiar with until recently is, um, I mean, as long as, I mean, unfortunately right now we're still largely dependent on fossil fuels. I went on a boat tour of the area around Linton where the oil companies and the gas companies have their tanks and their pipelines. They're extremely vulnerable to the earthquake. Um, so we're going to be doing outreach to those companies and asking them, what is your plan to strengthen those facilities so that the fuel supply won't be disrupted in the event of an earthquake? Because without fuel, you can't do much of anything. Without fuel, the fire trucks can't get where they need to go. Without fuel, the repair trucks, you know, the, the people doing repairs on infrastructure can't get where they need to go. So um, actually, I have talked to Senator Wyden's um, Oregon Chief of Staff a couple of weeks ago and said one thing that he can do as chair of the energy committee is get some oil companies on the phone and make sure they make that a priority. Mm -hmm. it's, your, it's your job now to think about horrible things like emergencies and, and mental health and, and the big one to, that will strike Portland. Um, do you feel like all of that has changed your behavior in any way? Is there, are, are you personally preparing for disaster? Um, we have a, a, an emergency kit that we ordered online that doesn't have enough stuff. Um, we have a lot of bottled water left over from a party, um, not enough. <laughs> we did bolt our house down. Um, one thing I will tell you, though, is that the people who work in emergency management, and I'm not just saying that because my fiance now is one of them, um, are delightful people. I mean, uh, <laughs> Carmen Merlot, who's the head of emergency management in the city, is a great person to work with. Joe Rizzi, who's the head of emergency management in the county, is a great person to work with. Actually, um, before I got that bureau, before Rachel had moved to emergency management, Rachel decided to be to have an emergency management dinner. And so we had Carmen and Joe over to our house, and they got into a spirited discussion about how quickly the moral fabric of society would break down <laughs> if, we, if we had a major disaster. And Carmen, it was, uh, it was like, oh, well, no, people in Portland are so nice, and we will all be prepared anyway, it'll be fine. And Joe was like, no, we'll be start shooting each other within three days. <laughs> what's, what's your take? How quickly after the big one would we resort to cannibalism? <laughs> uh, I think it'll be a neighborhood by neighborhood thing. <laughs> <laughs> I give Southwest like 12 hours. <laughs> oh. I live up in North Portland. I think I'll be, I think I'll be good. Um, all right, we're going to, on that note, we're going to open it up to audience, <laughs> to questions from the audience. Um, if you have a, if you want to write a question on an index card, please do so and hold it up. Um, as, as always, uh, City Club members can use the microphone to ask their question. It's over on that side of the room. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Before asking a question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Also, I will ask some questions uh, from the audience member index cards. I'm Edward Hershey. I'm a City Club member. This question has to do with behavioral ch changes that don't necessarily relate to disasters. When I first started coming to these events eight years ago, invariably some fellow would go to this microphone and ask an iconoclastic question to start things off. And finally I said to somebody, who is that? And the person said, that's just Steve Novick. <laughs> Clearly, I thought you were talking no about Ray Polani. <laughs> clearly you're no longer just Steve Novick, which gives rise to this question. Has there been anything in the past eight months where that Steve Novick and the Steve Novick who was commissioner would have approached things differently, number one, and number two, generally, has the vestments and responsibilities of elective office modulated or moderated the way you approach things these days? I, I feel like pretty much the same old Steve Novick. Um, Nick Fish and I compete to get in the most puns in council meetings. I mean, that's, you know, the way I would have before. Um, I still, I mean, I think that um, I might be moderately less feisty now than I was four years ago, but I think that's more age than it is being on the city council. No, I feel like, I mean, and um, the city council, I mean, I tend to think of myself as a reasonably intellectually curious person, and the city council is a great place to be that, because there's so much work that we do on so many issues that it's just fun to learn about. So now I, I feel pretty much the same. Chris, 
Chris Smith, City Club member. Uh, Steve, the difference between you and me is I have read all 700 pages of the high cost of free parking. <laughs> I want to go back to Barber Boulevard. Um, I had a chance to serve with a lot of dedicated citizens in the Southwest on the Barber Concept Plan, which is about making Barber a great place to live, work, shop, as opposed to a highway to funnel cars. Um, and you, know, you may have noticed we built a six-lane freeway to get the people from Tigard to Portland. So my question is, should Barber still be a state highway managed by ODOT, or should that become a Portland city street? Uh, that is a big, fat question, which I am not prepared to answer at this moment. I mean, I, I live off Barber. And we commute in on Barber, and actually, I mean, there seems to be, from our perspective, um, at least in the mornings, there seems to be plenty of room. Um, and it is sad to see something that could be a main street, you know, be, I mean, there, there's parts of Barber where you sort of look at it and think, wow, this could be a community center. Instead, it's just a highway. Uh, but, um, as I said before, I mean, ODOT does need to think about the people who use it as a highway. And I haven't spent enough time yet talking to the folks at ODOT and talking to people in Tiger, although I did have lunch with the mayor there um, a few weeks ago, and Sherwood and Tualatin and all of the other people who've gotten used to using it as a highway um, to know exactly what's reasonable to expect. I mean, obviously, ideally, we plunk down light rail or bus rapid transit on Barber and make it easy for people to commute that way. And if we had a bunch of money, we would just do that, and then it's a lot easier to argue that um, we s slow it down uh, for cars. Um, but that's I mean, one of a number of examples where if we just had the $3 billion now, um, then the questions become a lot easier to answer. Gilly Burlingham, City Club member. I identify myself as the number 15 bus because I left my car back on the farm when I mm -hmm. moved out here. Are you aware that there's a new group called Healthcare for All Oregon, which is working for single payer for the state? And if so, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I spent two years working for the Oregon Health Authority and the New Exchange, and I went in as a strong supporter of single payer nationally, and I came out an even stronger supporter because even though I think that Obamacare is going to be a boon, it would be a heck of a lot simpler to have single payer. Um, to be honest, I don't know, I haven't thought enough about how feasible that is to do on a state level. I know that there was a health care for all measure, a single payer measure that was on the ballot some years ago that got slammed. Um, and, but I, mean, I think that I mean, if we can figure out a way to, to do it, then I'm all for it. Um, I'm just, I haven't talked to the experts about the mechanics of doing it at the state level as opposed to a national level. Steve, I have a question from the audience on an index card here. It's very simple. It says, homeless population, what can be done? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, that is a really tough issue where I do not, I mean, there's a lot of people who know more about it than I do. I mean. Eric Sten has spent years working on homeless issues. Nick Fish has spent years working on it. Um, and it's, I mean, there's a long-term homeless po population um, that has mental health issues that needs ongoing support. There's also a lot of people that are homeless because of the Great Recession, and they just need the economy to come back. And it's, and also there are some people who I mean, I'm not saying it's a lot of them, but there are some people who may be partly because of some mental health issues, but who if you ask them, they will say, this is what we do, and they travel from San Francisco to Portland uh, to Seattle, um, and this is, I mean, this is the way they're, they're going to live. And ideally, you come up with policies that recognize those distinctions um, and treat people differently, and also, ideally, you have a lot more money. I mean. The problem that we've got right now in Portland is that there are people who are on the streets that are causing people worry, and, and, and there are some people that are threatening or disturbing one, some way or another. There are also people who aren't bothering anybody, they're just on the streets. So ideally, you craft policies that don't sweep everybody away with the same brush. I mean, in terms of um, actual you know, law breaking, 
Hartford, Connecticut, I know, has invested in sort of ramping up their response to street level crime and putting in the resources to make sure the people who commit actual crimes face swift actual con uh, consequences. Peter Korn wrote an article about that in the Tribune a number of months ago. And one way in which I frankly feel remiss is that I haven't called Hartford and found out, got more details on what they're doing and talked to the police and the mayor and the Portland Business Alliance about what you can do to address criminality as opposed to simply homelessness. Um, but I, I think that that's, I mean, we need to distinguish between criminality and homelessness, not say that two of them are the same thing. Um, but to address the actual problem of homelessness, we need to have a hell of a lot more money. Steve Schell, member. Steve, um, this is an intergovernmental question about CRC. Uh, CRC has gone from the something like uh, 35th in the nation to 18th in the nation, worst area uh, for transportation purposes. My question doesn't have to do specifically with CRC, but rather something that, that the former Metro uh, uh, exec, Rick Gustafson, said. He said there's a difference in cultures, and that's what caused our problem with Washington. What I want to know is whether or not you really see a difference in cultures. Specifically, he says that in 74, when we decided to kill the Mount Hood Freeway, Portland got control of the Portland Area Transportation Network, in essence, away from ODOT. That also happened in Seattle, but it didn't happen in Vancouver. Do you see a difference between how Portland deals with Washington Department of Transportation uh, in, in the over ongoing relationship? And if so, what do we do about that? If anyone's not familiar, CRC is the Columbia River Crossing, which is the highway expansion and bridge replacement project on I-5 between Portland and Washington. Well, to be honest, I haven't had direct dealings with the Washington Department of Transportation over the CRC. Those discussions have taken place you know, before my tenure and above my pay grade, so I can't really answer that. In terms of how the Oregon legislature dealt with the CRC as opposed to the Washington legislature, um, I think a big difference is that um, Portland is the biggest city and has the biggest metropolitan area in Oregon, and the CRC is a long way away from uh, Washington's biggest metropolitan area. So I think that there's fewer legislators in Washington who saw this as a big screaming issue just because it's not in their backyard. Um, that's not to say that they should have. I'm just saying that, I mean, I think that even with no difference in culture, you could see a difference in how people vote just because it seems more distant in one place than another. I have another question from the audience on these index cards. It says, uh, what would you recommend that the extra city money be spent on, referring to the city surplus? And they recommend music and arts in the schools? Uh, I think that the mayor's reaction to finding that we've got more money in this budget than we thought was exactly right. Uh, that when you have money, the surprise money that you can't expect to be ongoing for the future years, you should spend it to do things like pay off debt. Um, and that's what the mayor is planning to do with most of it. I also think that when, I, I'd like to think I would have said this even if it didn't happen to have the Bureau of Emergency Management, that um, when you have surprise money, you should use some of it to pay for surprises. And so I turned to Carmen Merlot in emergency management and said, what are some capital investments that you could use some of this money for? And she's taking a look at that. One possibility would be to use it to make the investments we need in a west side emergency operations center where we purchased the property but haven't made the improvements to the, to, to the property. So I think that the mayor's reaction is right. You don't spend it on ongoing programs. You spend it paying down debt and on capital investments. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, I'm on the board of a domestic violence shelter, and uh, the staff answers calls at night for the emergency help from women who have had to, with their children, leave their homes because of domestic violence. Um, I'm told that 90% of the time there's no available uh, resources for them. And sometimes the answer is um, ride the max to the airport overnight. Um, tough stuff. Uh, it's not exactly your portfolio, but um, 
what's your, you're good at public policy, uh, how can we deal with these kinds of issues? Well, again, I mean, particularly if you're talking about housing, um, it costs money. I mean, this is an issue that I know that Commissioner Saltzman um, is, feels very strongly about and has worked hard on, and he is pulling together a, a, a package to you spend some of our one-time money on, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of it has to do with domestic violence victims. Um, and again, it's, it's not something I'm an expert on. One thing that you are reminding me, though, that a couple months ago, The New Yorker had a long article about sort of innovations in dealing with domestic violence, particularly preventing fatalities. And I've been meaning to ask Commissioner Saltzman and the police unit that deals with domestic violence if they're familiar with the program that The New Yorker talked about, and is that something that we've implemented? Ted Kay, City Club member. First, a shout out to the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Thanks for finding the money from the feds to help renovate the Thurman Street Bridge and return it to its 19.5 glory. Congratulations <laughs> and good work there. My question, though, is about the arts tax. Uh, do you support putting the arts tax back on the ballot, and what changes would you make to it before you put it there, if you would? I would support putting the arts tax back on the ballot to make it uh, actually an income tax where people pay a percentage of their income, as opposed to a tax where if you make $30,000, you pay $35 a year, and if you make a million dollars a year, you pay $35 a year. Uh, I was outvoted. Uh, by the way, though, when you say shout out, I have neglected to make a serious shout out to Senator Jeff Merkley for stopping Larry Summers in his tracks. <laughs> Um, I have one more question here on this on these index cards, and then I think we've got one final question from the audience. Um, the city has traditionally been a great partner with our public schools. Can you talk about this relationship and where it's at today? Well, let's see. Um, in the past couple of years, uh, Mayor Adams found some money to help out the schools a couple of years ago, and uh, when they were in serious trouble. This last year, we were in trouble, so we reduced the number of police officers that we have in the schools. So our relationship is we help them out when we can, and they, you know, we don't help them out when we can't, and I think vice versa. Um, I think that, I mean, actually one thing that um, I've done in terms of promoting a stronger relationship, although this was not hard, is just um, I arranged a meeting between folks in the schools in PPS working on uh, building retrofits, building renovations, and Carmen Merlot and emergency management to make sure that um, what we're doing is coordinated and that they have her advice. Um, one thing I would like to do, I mean, if we had a chunk of money uh, to give to the schools, which hopefully sometime we have, what I would like to do is bribe them to start high school later in the day. Uh, because <laughs> there's, all, there's all sorts of research that shows that high school kids can't get up in the morning and they sleep through the day and also people without enough sleep eat more. Um, so I think that the next time we have money to give to the schools, I'm going to tell them, we're giving you a chunk of money if and only if you start high school later in the day. So that's the relationship I'd like to have. <laughs> uh, Mary Valent, City Club member. And back to the issue of money uh, as it relates to the Vista Bridge. Uh, we spent $236,000, I think, on a temporary barrier uh, with money from a department that is uh, clearly in the red. Uh, that money was found and allocated uh, under the guys that it was emergency, although it's been an 80-year problem on the bridge, um, and temporary. And so by using those two words, it's my understanding that you were able to uh, negotiate with the State Historic Preservation Office to allow that to happen, um, and you were able to com uh, uh, convince uh, Commissioner Fritz, who's in charge of the land use review process, to waive the legally required land use to put those up on the bridge. Um, so now that they're up on the bridge and we have some graffiti, um, which we haven't had up there before, and locks and people leaving things up there, I'm wondering, since we found $11 million, if now those words, temporary and emergency, um, can find funding uh, so that we can start designing the permanent uh, solution that will be historically accurate for the bridge. Well, there are sources of transportation money which we get an opportunity to apply for every few years, particularly federal sources. Um, which uh, where we're hopeful we might get some from the bridge down the line. Um, however, first we want to make sure that we have a design for a permanent solution that is consistent with the historic character of the bridge and where people in the neighborhood have some input. And that's why we're having this meeting next week. I felt that, yes, two people had been dying a year for 80 years, but to me that still seemed like an emergency. 
and if we had an intersection in the city um, where two people, where two pedestrians were being killed in crashes every year for 80 years, um, and there was a $236,000 um, crossing improvement that would have prevented that, then I would have felt that would be a very reasonable use of transportation dollars. So that was the same analysis that we had. Um, it is going to cost more to come up with a permanent solution, um, but I think the first thing to do is have a conversation with the community about what the right solution would look like, and then we will fight to get the money to fund it. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I think that's our whole forum today. Thanks for coming out, and thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs>